fixed function processing uh, blocks that are in GT200 exists outside of the core processor. Um, and if we were to add translation to it, we'd probably stick it up here um, in this in this section where we have you know set up and rasterization. We have the control for the, the various uh, shader types. Um, but there are problems with doing this. Um, and one of those is that as you go from shader stage to shader stage, all of the data that's describing the geometry has to leave the processor core, make its way up into this unit, um, and then come back down into it uh, for the next shading stage. Um, to be fair, for geometry, it's the position that's prim primarily important, but we're talking about vast amounts uh, of data. It also happens that um, attributes do have to make this path as well, uh, so things such as texture coordinates um, and so forth, because they have to go through some setup for the rasterization and the evaluation in the, in the pixel shader stage. But the, I think the, the point that I would make is that you have this single resource in the system being fed by this massive processor. And this invariably, as you try to scale things up to very, very high levels of geometric processing, this invariably becomes the bottleneck. This serialization point through this fixed function stuff. Now, historically, the reason that that's there, one of the reasons at least, making excuses in some sense for myself, is that the API imposes uh, sequential rendering semantics. It means that when you stuff a triangle in at the top of the pipe, it has to be rendered, the pixels from that triangle have to be rendered before everything else. So historically, what we've done is we've made sure that um, those triangles hit the pixel shader in order in a very strict order so that we can preserve the, the rendering order. And it's something that the API dictates and in fact is necessary for the development of applications. So um, breaking this sort of serialization point is a challenging, uh, a challenging task. Another facet of this is sort of another weakness facet of this problem, which is kind of get, getting to what you're asking about, is it's hard to scale this. You know, I can build some big rip-snorting GPU, some very, very big, powerful, expensive GPU, and it's got one of these units. Okay, well now I want to put that same GPU, that same architectural GPU, in a netbook. <laughs> you know, what do I do? Well, I can put this incredibly overbuilt geometry subsystem in the netbook, um, and, you know, and one of these guys, and you know, that works, but it's not very cost-efficient. Um, so, that's also a problem. So how do we approach this? So we took um, the processing that was happening in that, in that bar at the top, and we created two engines. Um, one that handles sort of the world space processing, basically the processing before you reach the rasterizer and before you do the pixel shading, and one that does the screen space processing, which is really taking care of the transition from triangles and lines to pixels. Uh, so that divide between world space and screen space. Now, in this engine that we've called the polymorph engine, um, this engine is responsible for fetching um, vertex data, the data that describes surfaces or triangles, um, into the engine. It's responsible for doing the fixed function tessellation that we described on a couple of earlier slides. It takes care of the viewport transform, basically mapping, doing the, the last bit of uh, work before things go to screen space. It also takes care of some of the setup for um, evaluation of the pixel shader. And finally, there's a feature in, that was introduced in DX10 that allows you to, at the just before the rasterization phase, save off the geometry that was generated. So in fact, in DX11, it's kind of interesting, you could save off, if you wanted to, all of the triangles that were generated, synthesized by the GPU. Now down in raster, the primary operations that occur in here is 
first you compute edge equations that tell you basically where the triangles are and make it efficient to do um, rasterization. We also have, um, coming out of raster, you go into z-call, which basically takes care of occlusion calling. It takes care of efficiently throwing away stuff before you do uh, sample by sample tests against the z-buffer. Okay? And kind of with, with this change, as, as Jonah mentioned at the outset, we got an 8x um, boost in geometry performance. But how do we do that? And exactly what does that look like? <clears throat> Here you see the block diagram that Jonah put up at the beginning with some, uh, I would say white space, but it's really gray space, some blank spots. But this is what it looks like. We took the, <clears throat> excuse me, the polymorph engine and we created 16 of them. This took me days to do, so I hope you all appreciate it. <laughs> and, then we, <coughs> and then we basically put an instance of these engines in each of the SMs, which is sort of, kind of in some sense, the lowest um, unit of scaling in the, in the architecture. Um, and similarly, we took um, the raster engine. Um, I didn't do the accordion thing. It was just like too much. Um, and then we basically push those out into this next higher level of kind of architectural replication. So you have a rasterizer per GPC. This stands for graphics processing cluster. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we guys had to really introduce that, that term. Yeah, so that this, this is sort of this new level of hierarchy that exists in, in, for, in the GF100 architecture that never existed previously. That you can almost think. It, a GPC is almost a whole GPU in and of itself now, right? Some of the, the other things that were that were just one up before now are sucked into the GPC, and you almost have effectively four GPUs all running in the same guy, Co coordinating with each other. As Henry mentioned, there's this ordering concerns you have to you have to uh, obey. So we have all this communication going on to make sure that we're obeying the API semantics, but that the, these uh, units can operate much more independently uh, than, than they could with just one monolithic block. Right. So in fact, what happens is. Um, you know, there's a lot of expansion that happens here <clears throat> when you're basically doing tessellation in a given uh, SEM, but we basically use the cache hierarchy to keep all of the data on die um, that happens during that amplification. And there's a lot of, um, well, let's see, it's hard to just, it's a little bit difficult to describe, but basically there's a lot of infrastructure for me, for ensuring that we maintain all of the sequential rendering semantics. Even though things are going on in parallel all over the chip, they're not going through any single sort of serialization point that kind of naturally ensures ordering, we keep things in order. And that's probably, as much as anything, from my perspective, one of the trickiest things. It turns out that moving the vast amounts of data on the die efficiently to do load balancing and so forth is also really challenging. But the rendering semantics are, are difficult to, to pull off. You might explain why ordering is important. Oh, that. <laughs> OK. So when I take it for granted, and I, I suspect most people who write uh, software do. But So the reason that rendering ordering is important is that um, if you change the order in which triangles get sort of hit the frame buffer, especially if you have blending going on, you get a different picture. So it's one thing. And, and, and we often call this determinism, meaning if I send in the same batch of triangles, I should get the same picture every time. Now, the worst thing that can you, you can do is have a system that's non-deterministic, which means that you don't get the same picture every time. And what the, the visual result of that is the image would be changing constantly. Frame to frame, an image that should be constant and solid would actually flicker and wobble and it would look horrible. But worse, from a, in some sense, from a business perspective, as you move from architecture to architecture, from vendor to vendor, you know, chips in a family, you'd get different pictures. And this is just a QA disaster. I mean, this is a bunch of reasons, but anyway, that, that touches on some of it, and you seem to get that. So, um, any, any other questions? Okay.